Hello there. Let's uh, take a few minutes to take a look at uh, the magical supercell. By the way, there's only two liquids that are uh, in the supercell: ferrofluid and mouse milk. Mouse milk is a basically an antique version of WD-40. It's uh, got some nasty chemicals in it, like toluene, naphthalene, a couple little pipettes, a few drops of liquid, and these are optically flat glass. So what you're looking at is a, a few microns thin of liquid. Actually, you have a total of a few drops of liquid in total, of like four drops of mouse milk and a drop and a half of ferrofluid. And when you put the two pieces of glass together, 95% of it squishes out. So you're left with an insanely thin uh, layer of liquid. Optically flat glass is just like regular glass, except it is insanely flat. It is precisionly flat within a certain wavelength. And this is just running with hardware LEDs. I made one of these uh, years ago. Instead of using uh, LEDs, I used sunlight. I actually uh, used a uh, aluminum reflector that draw the light into the edge. The light is shooting into the edge, and uh, that's where the liquid is between the two flat pieces of glass. These three little things right here are just clear tape that's holding it together. Since I have to take it apart because the image burns in from the powerful magnetic fields, it means I have to tear it apart rather frequently because it's so sensitive built like this. It doesn't matter if it's one light or ten lights or one light in total ringing it like in the sun which I have that video from years ago. The image is still the same. You're looking at constructive and destructive interference between the magnetodielectric, yeah, the conjugate geometry of the universe, the secret of the universe in actuality. Let's uh, take a look at something simple first here. Since this is a Teflon-coated uh, magnet, it's actually quite a powerful one. Since it's sitting on the glass, it means the surface is very slippery also too relative to the Teflon coating on the magnet. So since the uh, geographic uh, south is this direction, and the geographic south is where the magnetic north is, yes? That means whichever side of the magnet points this way will be the south side of the magnet. So the actual south pole of the magnet will point towards the geographic south because that is where the uh, magnetic north pole is located at. So here we go. Whoops. I let it uh, roll a little too much there. There we go. You see it wants to turn this way. And also too, I don't know if you can make it out, there is a uh, blue shift over here, even though the liquid is only one color, the mix with the ferrofluid and the mouse milk, you can actually see a blue shift here and a red shift over here. We actually have a phase disparity of one to five. That's a disproportionality due to geomagnetic precession in any magnet because magnetism is the dielectric field. It is specifically the three-dimensional force vector of the creation of space, magnitude, and of course, that which occupies the space and magnitude. And space has no property, as Tesla said, that being the magnetic field. So the three-dimensional force vector thereof. So you can actually see that. So it doesn't matter how I turn this without it falling down, of course, it will want to spin that way because of incredibly low friction because of the glass surface and the Teflon coating on the magnet. So now I know this is the geographic, uh, excuse me, the uh, south pole of the magnet because it is pointing geographically south, which is where the magnetic north is. Yeah. And let's uh, zoom in a little better here. Here we go. We can take a look. Everywhere you actually see the light is where we have constructive magnetism, and everywhere you see the absence of light, we have constructive dielectric. Of course, they're all tilting towards. You're actually looking at the top down of a torus. Of course, you're looking at the toroidal field of the magnet. And of course, with these three dimensional. Uh, vectors if you actually get in on it at an angle and of course you're looking at it top down the holographic imagery is quite incredible i don't want to leave it sitting there too long because it burns in an image by burning in i mean the ferrofluidic particles of the uh, nanoparticles of iron and the ferrofluid will clump because uh, with the dilution of the tooling naphthalene and the mouse milk it burns in the image pretty good here we have a little cylinder magnet. This is a neodymium iron boron N48 cylinder magnet, uh, one half inch. I'm just gonna put it, now this is not an image. I don't think a lot of people, since I haven't done a supercell video in a long time, don't realize that there's no image here. We just actually have light pouring in from the side of this glass into uh, this uh, ferrofluid and uh, uh, mouse milk. Now the mouse milk is acting as a surfactant to allow the nanoparticles of the ferrofluid to move easily. So you're actually able to get uh, use the light to paint the image of the magnetodielectric geometry. And I'm going to show you something really fascinating here towards the end of the video. I'm going to show you genuine pyramid power. 
Now, I have no connection to New Age stuff at all, but there is one instance where pyramid power is real. Here you can actually see the plane of inertia right here. You see this bright, bright white line. That's the plane of inertia along the middle of the magnet. Like I said, I, the only reason I'm moving it around is so I don't burn in the image too heavily. If it sits too long in one spot, here you can actually see it really good. You zoom in the image. I'm already zoomed in as far as I can. The plane of inertia right there. You can see that white line too? Right here, a plane of inertia between the uh, conjugate geometry of the point non-specific field incommensurability that actually defines the geographic north and south pole because a magnet doesn't actually have north pole or south pole. We actually have the pressure mediation of the magnetic and the toroidal geometry. We're looking at, of course, at the cross-section side on of the donut. And of course, we're seeing the vortex top and bottom. That's all the vortex is, is we're looking, when people talk about field vortexes and vortexes in nature, they're talking about uh, the uh, displacement towards counter space or inversely the uh, the uh, the placement towards the uh, force and motion vector of magnetism. That depends on, you know, whether you look at a glass half empty or half full, you'd be looking at the top-down uh, geometry. Uh, there we go, let's get a little bit of focus. Of uh, the torus, we could say, well, that's the magnetic, and someone else will say, now we're looking at the dielectric. Well, of course, you're both right. Here we're looking, of course, top-down on the pole of the magnet. Right now, I can know that we're at redshift. We're looking at the north pole of the magnet because the coloration Hard to get focused since uh, the lines aren't just super, super sharp here. But uh, let me, I don't know if I want to place it down like that, but let's uh, do this number. There we go. People always love this image. It looks like an owl's face. A lot of people say it looks like an owl. Does. You're looking like at the owl's eyes over here. Of course, right here. We're looking, you see this bright white line. This is a plane of inertia that separates out the uh, the inverse polarities of force and motion, which makes up the toroidal donuts of the magnetic field. And of course, here you can actually, people say, yeah, it looks like black holes, or it looks like a sinkhole. And that's correct. We actually have, of course, the dielectric. Everywhere you see the absence of light, remember. Doesn't matter if we're looking at a side on, doesn't matter if we're looking at a top down, it makes no difference. Wherever we see the absence of light, we're looking at the construct of dielectric towards the plane of inertia, towards counter space. And everywhere we see light, we're actually seeing construct of magnetic. Actually, the lines of force and motion, right? And everything here is, of course, increasing inertia and acceleration. The absence thereof, just like constructive and destructive interference that people will see in the so-called dual slit experiment, which, of course... I don't understand because dual slit experiment starts out with false suppositions about the nature of light. Light's not an emission, light's not a wave, light's not a particle, light is not traveling, light does not have a speed. It has the hysteresis of its rate of induction, yeah? maximum rate of propagation, just like sound, the speed of sound, which we've all heard of the speed of sound. Sound is not an emission, the speed of sound, of course, is the hysteresis, the rate of induction of the nitrogen and oxygen in the case of a sound perturbation. That's why Nikola Tesla said light is uh, a sound wave in the ether. Here we see the plane of inertia. Here we see, over here we see a, a blue shift. Over here we see red shift. Even though the liquid is all one color, we can still see shifting in the light. So I know we're looking at the south pole over here, and over here we're looking at the north pole. Yeah. Also, too, if I flip it over here. Yeah. You can see right... And uh, I don't know if you notice this or not, I can't zoom any further without uh, taking uh, the camera out. You see this bright white line right here? That's the actual outer periphery of the magnet. The reason why this white line is so bright is because this is the strongest concentration of the magnetic field, which is at the centrifugal edge. You'll see another ring here and another ring, and the rings are lessening. And, of course, here we have nothing whatsoever, as it should be, right? Now, if you bring two magnets together, if we could see through two magnets, which of course we can't through this since it's a solid magnet, but if we use a ring magnet, let's just think about this a second. Let's do a thought experiment before we actually do it. If we bring two magnets together, I'm gonna to put this one underneath the supercell and this one on top. As they come together, they are going to try to create one magnetic field because everything is about pressure mediation. And as that happens, you should necessitatively see an increasing portal of the plane of inertia. In other words, the two magnets are coming together. We will see, since we have 
a cross-section view. This is what people don't understand. So, well, this magnet is donut-shaped, it's hollow, but it makes no difference as far as Mother Nature is concerned because the magnetic field is one singularity entity, even though, of course, there's a giant hole right in the middle of it. As we bring these two magnets together, we'll be able to see on the supercell an increasing portal yeah, of towards the plane of inertia or towards counter space. That's where this black coal will increase as I bring these two magnets together and they try to make one singularity of a magnet because magnets, of course, accelerate towards one another, not due to magnetism, but due to dielectricity. And as the dielectricity increases, this black coal will increase. So let's bring these two magnets together, which is not magnetic attraction, by the way. There's no such thing as magnetic attraction. It's dielectric acceleration. So let me carefully do that without letting the magnet slip. You see the size of it now? Let's get it closer. And here you go. As I bring it closer, there we go. And as I actually bring them in opposition, you see the hole gets smaller. Here we go. Let me see if you can see this better. Right here. There we go. Just the ring magnet by itself. Okay, the other magnet's over here. I don't know if you can see it or not, but the other magnet's over here in my hand. There's the ring magnet alone. Oops, sorry about that. These are powerful little neodymiums. But as I bring it closer, you also see the magnetic ring out here. You'll see the plane of inertia. Right now we have the magnetic field outside of the ring magnet there, but you'll see the plane of inertia as I bring it further away from the camera, you'll see it. There we go. Let's just take a look at the ring magnet alone. And then we'll take a look at a pyramidal magnet, a really, really powerful pyramidal magnet. Okay, let's uh, get an edge on. I'll hold the magnet like this. That way you can get an edge on view of the magnetic field. You can actually see a toroidal donut. I'm just actually sound, holding this uh, at an angle relative to the face of the camera. You actually see the toroidal field? Let me wiggle it around. I'm just tilting this like a tilt-a-whirl. I'm just keeping the magnet from slipping off the glass and holding it with my finger is all I'm doing. I have nothing underneath the supercell. So the only thing we're looking at now is the magnet edge on as it's sitting on top of the supercell. Here you can see it. So you can see another donut or toroid inside of the ring magnet where of course nothing is but of course something is there and that of course is the conjugate field of the magnetodielectric and of course the corresponding constructive and destructive lines of interference between the magnetic and the dielectric. Now let's place the magnet, the ring magnet underneath. Let's get it closer to the camera. Let me hold it up and place it there and then we'll uh, twist it at an angle so you can actually get a look at it there. Now the next magnet I'm going to show you is a really powerful pyramidal magnet. The one and only time where we can say pyramid, uh, pyramid power is real. And by real, I mean palpably and literally real. It is measurable with a Gauss meter. Is in the case of, let me get these other magnets out of the way because they're going to slam to that pyramid magnet like crazy because it is really powerful, little sucker. It's not little actually at all. It's, a, it's an enormous magnet. The one time where we can say Pyramid power is real. Here, I'll show you the magnet, how large it is. Now, it has to be made like this, combined into two pieces. But just like a fireman's hose, I don't know if you know about a fireman's hose, but it's actually shaped like a, uh, you know, a pyramid. It actually takes all that water and it constricts it and it comes out at extremely high pressure. So you shoot it up into taller buildings. But this is the one case where pyramid power is real because all the magnetic flux is concentrated right here at this tiny little point, and it is visible underneath the, uh, let me actually place the supercell in relation to, there we go, there's the tip right there. You can see, you see this super bright white spot right here? It's a completely a different color. It's hard to focus on this since I got it so close to the camera because the magnet is so huge, but you can see this bright white spot here and as I bring it towards the pyramidal face that's parallel to the camera face, 
right here. The outline of the magnet is right here. So the magnetic flux is concentrated there. Let me turn the magnet towards the fat bottom part underneath. Yeah, and place it right there on the side. Yeah, it's a powerful sucker. That's actually nearly one Tesla at the tip of that magnet. So, anyway, I hope you liked this video. I hope it uh, cleared some things up. Mother Nature is incredibly simple. Everything is pressure mediation, centrifugal force in motion, increasing inertia and acceleration, so you can have capacitance, resistance, permeability, and permittivity. Mother Nature only works off of pressure mediation, and magnetism is the dielectric field. The loss of that energy or inertia manifests as centrifugal three-dimensional force vector, which, of course, manifests the magnetic field. And this is the secret behind, under, above, from all directions of the entire universe. There's no escaping it. The conjugate geometry of the universe, the toroidal geometry of magnetism, and the hyperboloidal or hourglass-shaped geometry of increasing inertia and acceleration towards counter space. Where is counter space at? Counter space is nowhere, because if it were aware, it would be a Cartesian locus in space and time. It is nowhere. It is counter space. You can say subspace, you can say the ether, you can say zero point energy. It makes no difference. But there we go, folks. And remember, everywhere you see light, you see constructive magnetism. Everywhere you see the absence of light, you see constructive dielectric. Yes? It's just that simple. And it really is simple. It's as simple as centrifugal force of motion and. Uh, dielectric inertia and acceleration towards counter space. Space is the generation, excuse me, magnetism is the generation of space. Space is nothing. Space is the after effect of the loss of energy or inertia. Space is literally the negative image of infinity or eternity or of absolute power. Um, the negative image of fulfillment, which of course would be metaphysical depravity, but uh, mass and magnitude. People consider real that which is unreal, and people consider unreal that which is truly real. Here you can actually see the burn-in. If you leave a magnet sitting there too long, it's so sensitive, it'll leave in a, a burned-in image on the ferrofluid. Yeah. So I hope I kind of made that simple, and I hope you liked the video. And I don't think I can focus this close. But uh, here we go. Thank you for watching. Goodbye.